All right. And can you see my slides? Yes. Okay. All righty, everybody. Well, welcome to our first ever live CEU from the Missouri Occupational Therapy Association. My name is Clarice Miller, and I'm our Director of Practice for MOTA. And our co-presenter is... Hi, I'm Clara Schuler. <laughs> I'm the current uh, Vice President for MOTA. So welcome. All right. And for those of you who are wondering, we will release the slides after the presentation. Um, so be on the lookout for that in your email. So we'll send it out as a PDF. We'll also be potentially sending out a couple of attachments. Um, and there will be a quiz at the end in order to show your competency. We'll give you probably about a week to complete that quiz, but it's only a few questions. Um, you will need to receive 80% accuracy on those quiz in order to get credit for the CEU, but after you take it, you can go back and change your answers if you didn't get the 80%. Um, as a reminder, this is only open to our MOTA members, so thank you to all of you who are uh, here and our MOTA members. We wanted to really make this a special event and demonstrate the value of the Missouri Occupational Therapy Association. So if you have friends who would be interested in attending the seminar or um, watching the recording afterwards, we ask that you encourage them to please become a member, in which case they will then be able to access the CEU. So let's get started. So the objectives of this CEU tonight are to identify general billing guidelines for telehealth in Missouri, discuss the differences and similarities between varying therapy practices in telehealth, and understand the barriers that exist in telehealth practice. So as a disclaimer, I just want to make sure everyone knows that this information is primarily meant to be ed for educational purposes. We aren't trying to make any kind of legal advice or recommendations for how to run your practice or what you can or can't do. Um, as we were discussing just a couple of minutes ago, information is constantly changing, especially under the state of emergency. So information that may be accurate in this moment may not be accurate by tomorrow. So it's really important that if you're going to use this information in your own practice, that you make sure to confirm it with outside sources, a billing professional, your lawyer, um, however you need that to happen. But we just wanna make sure that everyone's aware uh, that this is not necessarily legal advice, it's just trying to provide some educational information. So there's multiple different types of telemedicine or telehealth, um, and we wanna make sure that we're kind of just covering the basics for what we're talking about. So telehealth and telemedicine, they used to be a little bit different, but now they're used predominantly interchangeably. So it's basically when beneficiaries or our patients engage with eligible providers who aren't in the same location using an interactive two-way telecommunication system. So this is basically when you're using a video chat, a phone, something that is a virtual communication system between the provider and the beneficiary. Another term that we hear a lot is remote patient monitoring. So this is a collection of patient health data, such as the heart rate, blood pressure, oxygen percentage, and it's transmission to a provider for assessment and recommendation. So this is a little bit different. This isn't where you're directly talking to a patient. This is where, let's say, you're asking someone to record their, rate, their weights every day or their blood pressures every morning, and then they're sending that information to you and you're making a decision about their plan of care based on that information. So it's quite different from something such as telehealth. And then there's e-visits. This is another term that might be new to many of you after the state of emergency. E-visits are consultative in nature, so they're not meant to be the same as a telehealth visit. Uh, the focus is on answering questions and providing clarifications, but it's not really to provide interventions or an evaluation. And an important distinction here is that e-visits can only be used for patients who are established, and they can only happen every seven days. So there's a lot more restrictions on what counts as an e-visit, and this can't be used for a patient that you've never seen before. So this is something that some clinics have been utilizing if they had a patient on caseload in their private practice or their outpatient clinic, and then they closed their outpatient clinic, but they just wanted to you know, provide clarification down the road if needed. That's the kind of an instance where you could use an e-visit, and we'll get into those restrictions a little bit later. So telehealth in Missouri. Um, the Missouri Occupational Therapy Practice Act does not prevent occupational therapy practitioners from providing telehealth. It doesn't really say anything about telehealth in our Practice Act, and so therefore there are no restrictions. 
uh, we, you must be licensed in the state of Missouri to provide telehealth to beneficiaries located in Missouri. I believe under the uh, 1335 waiver that was waived that if you are outside the state of Missouri, you are eligible to now provide telehealth to beneficiaries located in Missouri. But typically under uh, typical law, you have to be licensed in the state of Missouri to provide telehealth to patients here. Eligible telehealth provider, we are eligible telehealth providers for Missouri Health Net, so that's our Missouri Medicaid. Um, this is actually something that wasn't new underneath the state of emergency. We have long time been telehealth providers um, under Missouri Medicaid, so that was a very uh, easy barrier. And then insurance, uh, the bulletin as of late, services must be at the same level as an in-person visit. So you can't be providing different services um, through telehealth than what would be typically covered under in-person. So the Medicaid plans only cover uh, what would be typically covered as an in-person visit. So if you can provide self-care under Medicaid in-person, then you can also provide self-care codes through Medicaid, but you can't provide a different service than what would be normally covered. So the benefits of telehealth, it allows therapists to treat patients in their own home environments. So it allows us to lay eyes on what their environment looks like, uh, what their living situation is, what the state of the caregiver is, if that's um, a concern. So it really allows us to get into their environment and it's a great way for occupational therapists to truly demonstrate the value of occupational therapy by taking into consideration the patient's environment into their plan of care. We can provide services without increasing the risk of exposure. That's why we've seen such a huge boom in telehealth is because we're reducing the number of people who have to come into clinics or have to leave their home. So providing our services, which are valuable in a way that doesn't increase the risk of our patients exposure to COVID-19 or the coronavirus. Um, and it can also improve access to individuals in rural areas. So telehealth is something that's been going on for a long time, especially in rural areas. Um, and it helps us you know, increase our access to individuals who may not have a clinic uh, close by. So barriers to providing telehealth. Licensure can certainly be a barrier. Um, under the current state of emergency, many states have applied for waivers to allow practitioners licensed in other states to see patients licensed in a different state. So for example, prior to the state of emergency, if you were licensed in Kansas, but the patient was in Missouri, you could not provide telehealth to that patient. Under the current state of emergency, because of a waiver that Missouri applied for that I believe does expire May 15th, um, you could be licensed in Kansas and not in Missouri and provide that service to someone in Missouri. But you wanna make sure that you're checking when those state of emergencies expire and whether or not a state has applied for waivers. Lack of coverage has certainly been a barrier. Um, Hospital-based clinics have also faced different barriers than private practices, uh, just based on how they are registered through Medicare and through private practice, and that's something we can dive into a little bit later as well. Access to broadband is obviously an issue, especially in those rural areas or for patients who might be low income. Not everyone has a data network on their phone or has access uh, to Wi-Fi or internet. Um, HIPAA compliance can be a barrier. A lot of insurance companies have waived HIPAA compliance in terms of the devices you're able to use, but trying to have a patient port portal that is HIPAA compliant can be a barrier. Um, certain practice acts in certain states don't allow individuals to participate in telehealth. And then also the supervision of assistance, it can get a little bit different in terms of telehealth. So it's requiring people to think about how they provide those services. So certain considerations are, you know, your HIPAA compliance, whether or not you need a waiver and what type of waiver and what it needs to say, um, specific telehealth informed consent materials, what type of technology you're able to use, the ethical and legal, legal guidelines of providing telehealth. Um, you really wanna make sure that you're gaining a competency in telehealth prior to engaging in telehealth in order to practice best practice. We don't want to be going from never providing it to doing it the next day if you haven't taken any competency credit. So it is best practice to look into those CEUs, learn the billing mechanisms, learn how to provide effective telehealth uh, prior to engaging in it. You really should indicate, um, dictate on progress notes and evaluations how these services were provided and if they were in person or online and where it was delivered. So you wanna be specifying, were you in your home or in the office? Where was the patient? Were they in their home? Were they in a caregiver's home? Or did it happen face-to-face? -face? 
uh, especially because a lot of insurances are saying you can bill it the same as you would in person, but especially for legal purposes, you want to be very clear how those services were provided and this should be dictated somewhere on the progress note. Many places don't say where you have to dictate that, so either in additional information or somewhere, but you need to make sure that it's written out for your own protection. You should also consider using patient feedback surveys or asking the patient afterwards what they thought, if they felt it was effective. You know, that way you're really gauging, especially if this is a new practice area to you, how patients are feeling about it, whether or not it's effective, um, and if it's working for your company. And not all services or patients are appropriate for telehealth. You know, if you're working with someone who's very low level or perhaps has a cognitive impairment, telehealth may not be best practice for that individual. And obviously you shouldn't be billing modalities or things, um, you know, like a manipulation if you aren't laying hands on that patient. So you really need to consider, and that's something where you're gaining competency and CEUs can be beneficial of what types of things you should or should not bill for under telehealth. So here's a little bit of a deeper dive into the billing for telehealth. Some of these are going to be a little more specific, others are going to be generalized, and we'll kind of walk through them together. So terms that you may hear, especially when reading insurance coverage or watching some of these CEUs are is going to be originating and distant site. So these are things that typically would be taken care of by your billing company or on the back end. The originating, originating site is where the patient or client is located. So if they're in the office or in the home and the distant site is where the provided or provider or you, the therapist is located. So whether or not you're giving telehealth from home, a hospital, an office, et cetera. Um, so places of service codes that you'll see listed are as the office, which is 11, the home, which is 12, and telehealth, which is 02. Now each provider has a different way of how they want you to code this, and we have that listed, but that's something where you really want to make sure you're clarifying with individual insurance agencies before you start billing how they want those things coded. Um, there's certain modifiers that you may need to use, such as 95, if it's a real time, or GQ, or CR. Those again are something that you wanna make sure you're clarifying with each pair before using those modifiers to try and reduce rejected claims. Some other things you might be hearing are synchronous. Synchronous telehealth is when it's live and it's face-to-face, -face, so it's more of a video conferencing. There's a feedback um, between the two of you, a conversation. And then there's asynchronous, which is like a store and forward type of information. So this might be something that's more common in, let's say like an e-visit or a telephone con consultation someone is calling you and leaving a voicemail or sending you an email to check in, images and videos, that's an asynchronous type of telehealth. So Missouri for Medicaid, occupational therapy practitioners are approved providers under Medicaid in Missouri, and this is typical even outside of the state of emergency. We have always been eligible as telehealth providers. Um, School-based occupational therapists are able to bill through a company called Therapy Log, but you do have to have a provider number and this is where, from the research that we've done, we've discovered that if a service is covered under the patient's typical Medica Medicaid plan that you can bill for face-to-face, -face, then it should be covered under telehealth. So you want to confirm before engaging with a patient with Medicaid what their plan covers, especially the differences between adults and pediatrics. Um, so that way you know what you can typically bill for face-to-face, -face, you should be able to translate to telehealth but again, it's always good to call and confirm before you engage in this practice. So hopefully you re reduce the risk of a denial. Now for Medicare, this is information that definitely could change by tomorrow, but this is the latest information we have. As of, I believe within the last few days in the end of last week, we are now eligible as telehealth providers under the 1135 Medicare waiver during the state of emergency. And I apologize, I think I called it a 1335 waiver, they're 1135 waivers. Um, they, so this is a state of emergency waiver that they've applied for previously under Medicare. We were not eligible telehealth providers, and this is currently only eligible during the state of emergency. So once the state of emergency expires, which we don't know when that will be, we will no longer be telehealth providers under Medicare. Um, so this goes retroactive though to March 1st, 2020. So again, we're still trying to figure out what exactly that means for practitioners and for providers, how we can bill for that. Um, but CMS did clarify that that was retroactive when they approved us as telehealth providers. Patient consent is required for Medicare and written is preferable to verbal, but they aren't making specific requirements. 
So this is, again, if this is new to your company, you want to make sure you have a specific telehealth waiver that's uh, where the patient can consent to receiving services via telehealth and not face-to-face. -face. And this must be documented in their plan of care and in their chart. The occupational therapist must be enrolled in Medicare program as an occupational therapist or the occupational therapy assistant. Um, so you must already have your provider information. You must have a valid license in the state related to the Medicare enrollment. So this is something where if you are seeing a patient in Missouri under Medicare, you must also be licensed in Missouri so that the state waiver does not supersede this waiver. So you wanna make sure again, that where you're, where you're clear on what the insurance wants. So you must have a valid license in the state related to the Medicare enrollment. The occupational therapist uh, must be furnishing the services in the state where the emergency is occurring. So let's say that Missouri's state of emergency waiver um, expires in the middle of May, then unfortunately, most likely uh, occupational therapy practitioners would no longer be able to provide telehealth through Medicare. So that's again, something that may change. Um, they may expand that, but that's something to keep an eye on and be aware of is where the emergency is and isn't occurring and when our state of emergencies expire. CPT codes are, um, our CPT codes were added as billable telehealth services. This was actually added quite a while ago, but they just didn't add us as eligible providers. Um, there is a special code designated for audio only if the patient doesn't have a video tech. So that is especially important for someone who perhaps doesn't have broadband or doesn't have access to a data for their phone. For a full list of CPT codes, you can visit that link. And that's again, something that will be included in the slides when we send those out in a few days, but you can also just access it on AOTA.org. A place of service must be the same as where the service would typically be rendered. So again, if you don't deal directly with billing, this isn't something you have to worry about, but if you do bill for your own services, you run your own clinic, this is something you need to be aware of. So you would not be billing that zero two for telehealth, you'd be billing the 11 or 12 for the home. If you're in a private practice, OTs and OTAs can provide therapy via telehealth. You'd be billed, um, it'd be billed by the supervising therapist and it's currently allowed under waivers for COVID-19. Um, direct supervision requirements must still be met. So underneath all these state of emergencies and under telehealth, the rules for CODA supervision does not change. For hospital-based outpatient clinics, this is where things can get a little bit messy. So hospitals can choose to allow therapists to provide these services and they must be registered as a hospital outpatient and the hospital would bill those services as if they were provided in person. So this is something that would be really beneficial and we hope to get a little bit more clearance and uh, uh, sorry, a little bit more information on how exactly this will take place and we'll let our panel discuss this further. So I'm not gonna read these slides for Radom, um, but the good news is that our hospital-based clinics should be able to provide telehealth um, under the new waiver. And this is something, again, I'll let Cindy get into later, but basically our patients' homes have to be uh, approved as provider-based department, and this has to be something that's communicated to CMS or Medicare. Other settings currently, SNFs and home health agencies cannot bill for telehealth services. Um, and then rehab agencies use the telehealth. It'll be kind of discussed and we're waiting for more information, but currently it's not allowed. And again, I just wanted to reiterate that telehealth allowances are only valid during the current public health emergency. So if the federal government decides to end the public health emergency next week, then everything goes back to how it was in terms of Medicare and telehealth for occupational therapy. So e-visits, these are non-face-to-face patient-initiated digital communications. Um, so these are things that typically would have been provided in the office um, or that require a clinical decision that would have been typically provided in office, but you don't currently have that opportunity, especially with patients trying to stay home. It's provided on a digital platform like a patient portal and the patient must consent to this type of engagement. It can only be billed every seven days cumulatively. So you can't say, well, I spent 10 minutes this day and 10 minutes the next day so I can build two separate. You would have to build that as a 20 minute code. And we'll list those codes a little bit later on, but that's an important. If you spend 50 minutes over seven days and 10 minutes over seven days, you don't get to build multiple separate codes. You just have to build the one code appropriately. You can only bill this code every seven days and the patient has to initiate a new contact for it to be billed again. So if your patient contacts you on Monday and you clarify and you respond 
and they contact you again about something different on Friday, you cannot just bill that code again on Friday. There has to be a full seven days before the bill code can be billed again. And the place of service would typically be your home or office, would not be telehealth. And occasionally, and you will need a geo modifier as these codes are considered sometimes therapy. There's also virtual check-ins. So these are typically like five to 10 minutes. This isn't something that occupational therapists would probably bill for very much, especially because the reimbursement's relatively low for these codes. Um, the patient cannot have been seen within the last seven days. Um, they typically, again, can only be billed by a physician. We've been approved to bill for them, but it's not something that may be uh, financially worth the investment. And it's really meant for only established patients. And with both of these, they have to be initiated by the patient. So you, the therapist, cannot call to check in with the patient. Um, you can call to let them know that these services are offered, but the patient has to initiate the contact with you after that. These are the e-visit codes. I'm not gonna go through them, but basically all that's different between them is the amount of time that you've spent. So if you spend 21 minutes or more, you're not gonna be paid differently than if you spend 21 minutes or 15 minutes. So again, something to keep in mind, and these codes are not super high in paying. I think they're like 20 to $30, depending on which code you use. So it depends on your business, whether or not it's worth the investment. TRICARE has approved us to provide telehealth, but you have to be licensed in the state where the, um, patient is, and you must use HIPAA compliant platforms. That has not been something waived by TRICARE, and you use your typical CPT codes. United Health is uh, eligible currently through June 18th. Occupational therapists can provide telehealth, and you would use that O2 place of service, the telehealth place of service, um, and cost sharing is typically waived for in-network providers. Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield um, was effective for 90 days as of March 17th, and cost sharing is waived for in-network providers and you'd use the different modifiers and the telehealth place of service. Blue Cross Blue Shield Kansas City, effective through June 30th and it's available only to in-network providers. So this is something that would probably impact those hospital-based clinics um, where they may find that individual practitioners would end up being out of network even though the hospital is in-network. Um, and they're only covering e-visits, so they are not covering telehealth, so they're covering those more restrictive e-visits that only can occur seven day, every seven days. Um, so it's similar guidance, to, again, to Medicare. Cigna, you can deliver virtual care for any of services on their current fee schedule. So this is something that you really want to make sure you clarify uh, with the individual plans, and that applies for all of the private insurers. Every individual's plan is going to be very different. So you want to confirm before you start billing for telehealth that it's covered um, and further restrictions may apply. So AOTA has an excellent link on telehealth services that you should check out and it breaks out every single uh, private insurer who is currently covered telehealth and it describes it um, and how they're covering it and provides you with links for where you can access that information. But again, it's just best practice to go ahead and confirm with the individual uh, provider and plan that it is covered for that patient before you bill. So different ways to advocate, advocate for telehealth. There are currently a couple bills in the House and or Senate. The Connect for Health Act, this isn't a new bill. It's been around for quite a while. This would approve occupational therapy practitioners to be eligible for telehealth under Medicare permanently if passed. And there's also the Emergency COVID-19 Telehealth Response Act. I haven't checked in on this bill in a little while, but it was recently introduced, I believe, within the last week and a half or so, thanks to a lot of advocacy by AOTA and other providers. Um, but this, again, would also fix the problem of occupational therapy practitioners not being eligible to provide telehealth under typical conditions. You can always speak to the director of rehab or your company about why occupational therapy practitioners should be engaging in telehealth if you aren't already. You can educate others about the value of OT and telehealth. Some people don't understand how OT can work in a telehealth setting. So it's really your job to educate and advocate for our profession. And you can always write an article or share a story in the news about occupational therapy and telehealth. So there's so many different avenues for where you can share your stories. Um, you can share them with Moda, Facebook, Twitter, you know, send a letter to the editor. Those sorts of things are all great ways to demonstrate the value of occupational therapy through telehealth and during the current crisis. Um, I did include the link down at the bottom to AOTA.org take action and that's where you can send letters to your congressmen about the congressmen and women about the above um, bills that are currently introduced. 
There's multiple CEUs on telehealth. Uh, AOTA has some great ones and also one that I uh, watched especially to learn uh, for this seminar was from the American Colleges of Rehab Rehabilitation Medicine or ACRM. It was produced in early March so some of the information is outdated but it has two really great speakers. It's about an hour, hour and a half, um, both from AOTA. So I highly recommend you check those series out. So I will go ahead and turn this over to Claire to introduce our panel members. Perfect. So for the second. Oh, oh. sorry, Claire. That's okay. Are you able to bring it back up and then pass on the? Yes. Okay. Got it. It says I have control. Um, so our panel members for tonight, which um, happen to be the part of the second half of this um, presentation, are all individuals that are currently experiencing um, telehealth at this time and have a background in practicing um, telehealth with various populations. So our first, in, our first panel member is Cindy Kempf, who's the current director of clinical services at RPI Services. Um, as well as we have Jeff Silvernail, he's a school-based practitioner, so he's in pediatrics in Kirksville, as well as Pat Nellis, who is a professor, as well as director of clinical operations at Washington University. I don't know if I can forward to the next slide. There you go. Perfect. So for each presenter, um, we're going to give you guys like eight uh, to 10 minutes to speak um, before we move on to questions and answers from the rest of the individuals participating um, tonight. But we're just going to ask for you to give a general background on your practice setting and your typical patient population, um, as well as describe your experience with telehealth. So how either the individuals that you manage or you yourself as a practitioner set up your uh, normal telehealth settings. Um, and then we also have a list of questions that I'll show in a minute that um, are on the next slide, but feel free to answer those questions in a way that works for you. And of course, feel free to elaborate as needed. So Cindy, um, tell us about your backgrounds. Well, I'm just laying here on the beach, as you can see, for those of you that can see my screen. <laughs> <laughs> so um, my background, we work in, we have um, some outpatient clinics, traditional outpatient clinics, and then we also provide Medicare um, services to primarily Medicare population in assisted living, memory care, and independent living. So for us, initially, um, our outpatient clinics were the ones that first had the issue because once they did the stay-at-home order in the state of Missouri and in St. Louis, um, everyone, all of our patients canceled. Um, and that was an issue from a staffing, like what do I do with all the therapists? But also what we found is our patients. What do we do with the patients? They had questions. Is it safe for them to come in? Is it not? So we started looking into different options. And at that time, obviously Medicare was not allowing us to provide any services. So we started providing to some of our, um, some of our other insurances. And it was interesting because my biz, my part of the business, I always work in um, a lot of people, a lot of our patients' homes. I'll go see their home environment. And some of the therapists who are only in the outpatient clinic said, man, this is great. I, I give them these exercises and I think they're going home and, I, and I'm sure that they're doing right. And now I'm watching them doing it at home and I'm realizing, oh my gosh, that bed is not the right place to do it. Let's try it here. So it's been really, really good. They've, I think that they've really enjoyed that and felt like it was very beneficial. Um, then, um, as Clarice had said, last Thursday, we got the announcement that, woohoo, Medicare is going to cover telehealth service. And everybody was really, really very excited, very, very excited. And then Friday, we found out that, oh, wait, it's not everybody. It's just those, primarily those people that work in private practice. So if you are a private practice practitioner, you are able to bill OT services through telehealth, through Medicare. And then we got additional clarification and you can also, if you are an outpatient, you provide service through a hospital outpatient um, facility. If you choose, and what we're hearing is not everybody has chosen to do that. There's on that one slide, it talked about all of the things that you need to do because basically what you have to do is you have to make your patient's um, home address kind of an extension site. 
And so you have to notify CMS that you're going to do that. And you really have to be able to explain why do you need to do that? Um, you know, and, and it's interesting because this, this crisis has been going on for a while. And it's kind of like now we're finally getting to where they're starting to eliminate some of the stay at home orders. And it'll be interesting to see what happens with telehealth. I think that we really see a huge benefit to the telehealth. Um, um, and, you know, as far as we've talked about doing this in the past, but I, you know, we went from, you know, we're a relatively small organization. So we went from, oh my gosh, everybody's going to be at home. We don't have any patients coming in. How are we going to meet their needs? So we started initially not even billing the patients. We were just doing some check-ins, um, you know, mostly initially by phone. How are things going? We're worried about you. Are you doing your exercises? Do you have any questions? And then we started from there, we kind of started doing, well, you know, let's do this through FaceTime. Um, and that's how we kind of grew. And then we found that some of the insurance companies, we were able to bill for that. That was even better. Now we're getting bill, uh, paid for what we're doing. Um, and then it's just kind of grown that way. The other part of our business is we provide ther uh, therapy services and in skilled um, uh, independent living, assisted living and memory care. And some of our facilities say, we don't want a therapist that's going to multiple different buildings coming into our community. If I have a CODA that's working in that building, they're fine with that CODA being there, but they don't want a therapist who's going to multiple different buildings coming in and doing an evaluation. So this is not technically, this is not telehealth and we're not billing it at telehealth, but what we'll do is um, through FaceTime um, because Medicare has waived the HIPAA compliant platform. We don't, at this point during the, the um, emergency, we don't have to have a HIPAA compliant platform. So I will actually be in the facility. I'm not, you know, actually inside the facility, but I'm at the facility. My CODA is in with the patient and I'm doing my evaluation um, and, um, or I'm doing a reassessment on a 10th visit or I'm doing a discharge. But instead of me actually doing it, I'll say, okay, let's go ahead and stand up. Let me see you stand. And then my CODA will help the patient stand up, we'll do transfers and everything that I would need to be able to do. I'm able to watch all of this through video and I'm giving them directions. It's just like I'm in the room. So. You know, this is not, that is not, we're not billing this at te as telehealth, but it is a way that we've been able to kind of get around some of these facilities where we have patients who clearly need therapy and we can't, you know, we can't get in there. So, you know, just, I, I think that you got to be comfortable with what you're doing. We got some input from a lot of different compliance experts um, just to make sure that what we were doing was okay. And everybody felt like that that was, you know, a, an op, a, a good way to do that. In like acute care settings, they clearly in the COVID units are doing things like that, where the OT is actually not going into the unit. Sometimes it's a CNA, sometimes it's a nurse, and they're doing the evaluations at some hospitals from what I'm being told. So, you know, when we select who is going to be able to do this, not everybody is appropriate for this. Um, we need to have somebody who's pretty motivated, somebody who has the cognitive ability to understand what we're doing. Um, one of my patients that I was working with physically um, at one of our memory care units, she thinks her, her daughter has died and they've tried to do like Skype and stuff with her, with the patient, but the patient just thinks it's a picture talking and doesn't understand that that's her daughter. So clearly she would not be somebody that would be appropriate for telehealth. And, and we are in this instance, we're, we're seeing her in person. So the majority of our visits, we are not doing through telehealth. We cannot bill through Medicare um, right now because we are a rehab agency. And one of the things that they said very clearly um, on the guidance that they provided on the 5th of May, they said skilled nursing, home health, you cannot do this through telehealth. Rehab agencies, they say you cannot do that through telehealth right now. We'll, we'll, we'll look into this and we'll get back to you, but right now we cannot do that. So Medicare, we're not doing it through some of the insurances we are. And um, Clarice did a great job of um, summarizing, you know, this insurance wants you to use this. 
use the AOTA website. There's some amazing resources on there, but as Clary, Clarice had said, you really need to talk to your insurers because, you know, the national one will say use the 95, but yours says, no, I, you know, I want you to use the GQ code. And those are all billing things, but I think it's important for you to be able to know when you're doing that. And then the last thing that I just wanted to just make sure that when you're doing this is that you have some sort of a statement on there that says that that patient is aware that what you're doing is through telehealth. Um, and so I'm just gonna read you one of the statements that we use when you're, we're doing some telehealth visits. We say the patient requested and has consented to this virtual visit in lieu of an in-person visit to mitigate the risk of a COVID-19 transmission. This visit was completed utilizing video conferencing technology from my home clinic um, or wherever you are currently. So we just, we put that in every note. So we have permission from the patient that says, yes, I will participate in this via telehealth. Our patients who've done it have loved it, absolutely loved it. Um, we work with a lot of older adults and um, coming into an outpatient clinic is a pretty scary thing. And so for them, whether or not we're actually billing, if we're not able to bill, we at least are, are keeping that communication going with that patient. So when this is all over, we'll able to be, be able to bring them back into the clinic. Okay, anything else that I should cover? That sounds great. All right. It sounds like you hit upon um, just about all of our questions. So thank you, Cindy. Um, so next we have Jeff Silvernail, who currently works in pediatrics in the school setting in Kirksville, Missouri. He's served on a board up in Kirksville pertaining to helping people with disabilities in all of Adair County. Um, and so he's currently working through his school district to bill Medicaid for telehealth. So Jeff, go ahead and tell everyone um, a little bit about yourself, about the setting in which you work and the students that you work with, as well as how you set up your telehealth sessions. Sure. We, um, up in Kirksville, we are rural, so you may actually hear my signal or my, uh, my communication break up from time to time because I, every once in a while, I hear you guys breaking up. So if, if, if there's poor communication, let sure. me know. But um, I've been up here for doing uh, direct services in the schools uh, for over 17 years now, um, but I started in outpatient and um, a variety of medical settings. Um, and then I basically contracted one, one of being an LLC and actually went out on my own in a rural area and then um, eventually wound up going on staff of the school district. Uh, so that's uh, kind of how I became to be where I'm at. Uh, and we serve, since we don't have a state school near us, uh, we serve a variety of, of kids uh, on and a variety of disabilities uh, that you might not always get if you had a state school near you. Uh, so we have severe, profound, uh, and, and every level in between, as well as uh, highly integrated, like high functioning autism, for example. So there's really quite a variety uh, that we serve in our district and we're probably one of the largest districts within 150 miles in the Northern area. Um, so a lot of people that are looking for services that are harder for them to pull in a small district uh, will come to our area. So uh, you, will, you will see that here. My experience, uh, I feel like the newbie <laughs> on, the, on the crew here, uh, listening to everybody because it's, um, it's a, it's a different experience, I think, in the schools, at least for me up to this point. And it's really been, I, I did a, some MOTA continuing education um, at St. Louis University um, a year ago, I think, or maybe two. And when I did that, I thought about exploring this and I was listening and I was starting to educate myself. And then, of course, uh, this emergency situation occurred. And I was already billing for many years in therapy log, which really makes all the coding and stuff that you guys, I can tell in the medical model have so much fun with. Uh, it actually uh, makes it much, I think, more streamlined, especially once you get used to their platform. Uh, so I've been, I've been really happy with that. And it made it easy for us to uh, add passwords or do ID meetings. It, it, they did a lot of the secured encrypted Zoom that made it easy, almost one click if you just want it to be for a client. 
Uh, the big thing in my setting, which I can kind of hear that others are doing that, is really having hands in the room. And so uh, to have parents there or caregivers that are available to really make sure, and first of all, the goals that we wrote weren't really written for this setting. They were really written for the school setting. Some of the things actually had to do with equipment uh, and using tools that were actually school-based. So some goals simply didn't fit. But then there was, then there was other opportunities. There was other opportunities to uh, be able to adapt a goal. Now, of course, we had to update that in the plan of care sometimes, or we had to uh, at least make sure to note it. Uh, and, and luckily the Medicaid Consortium for the Missouri School Board Association, uh, they have reps that are easy to get a hold of. So if you wind up in this situation, using that person as a resource is really important and you can get your answers actually fairly quick and maybe, maybe a little quicker for us because maybe there's not as high a number that's serving this area, but uh, it's been, Lisa Helm is our rep and she's been great. If you're concerned, um, if you're really being effective enough in your treatments. Um, I know I've been being new to it. I've been really looking to see, am I actually, can I see the real outcomes and can I communicate it well enough to get the level of physical or verbal cues or assistance in place and of course it's you're you're trying to judge it often through a video link um, like i was just hearing that there was a potential for an audio only link that would have changed potentially my billing over time but that's also something i would probably run through my msba rep um, to for the medicaid consortium to really kind of know because that's the main model that we bill otherwise we are more paid locally by uh, local taxes to school boards uh, and so, and that's, of course, you know, gives us some freedom and some latitude there. It's nice. But otherwise, I haven't, I've been doing it a short period. I don't feel like I've had much time to advocate when I look through your questions. Uh, the billing definitely runs through uh, therapy log. Um, I, you know, I, it, it's, it's an area that I was thinking as maybe a diverse way. I've, I've, I've worked in a private practice on my own before being an independent contractor. And so it appealed to me in that model and I wanted to learn more about it. I obviously none of us planned the emergency to learn this way, but it's been actually an effective way for me to sort of sort that out and, and really, um, in the moment, figure out uh, what fits and what doesn't. I know we're billing somewhere between 25, maybe 30, but no higher than 40% of our overall treatments. Uh, there's another 30 to 40% of those actual treatments where we feel, where we, we, we can't see the goal or we really don't feel it's being done effective enough. Um, so I know that's uh, a lot of what's being currently billed. And then there's, uh, in my case, so there's a 10, 20% where you're trying to reach out to uh, families and, 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 and had just not been able to make the contact. For us, it's a lot about maintaining participation and making sure the kids are still engaged and, and that the families are supported. And that's almost uh, the first call of the school district. And then the second call is to obviously, if we can do effective therapy that we can show clear outcomes for. Obviously, we want to be able to bill and, and be able to uh, bring uh, dollars back to the district for the services we provide. Um, so, and in our setting, the CODA, the CODA is typically, it, it, it can kind of vary, but in our district, we do have a, a CODA, and I know she's been reaching out, but under the Medicaid, um, Medicaid Missouri uh, Consortium, uh, codas are not able to be billed. They can't, they can't bill in that model. So, uh, but it doesn't mean that she's still not being used uh, to be able to still make sure participation is still occurring. Uh, and then, you know, it just puts more of the burden for billing on the OTs themselves. So I think yeah. I ran um, through the questions there. Yeah, no, that was great. Thank you for that input. As someone who's also a school-based practitioner, um, currently within SSD, we're not allowed to bill for our telehealth, but I may have a CODA underneath me or working with, not underneath me, working with sure. me right. <laughs> this summer. And so, I mean, that's it's unfortunate, but then also something to be aware of at the same time. Um, but thank you for that input, Jeff. And thanks for, of course, being here. <laughs> No um, so then next we have Pat Nellis, 
who is currently the Director of Clinical Services at Washington University, as well as a professor. Um, so Pat, uh, please go ahead and give us some information pertaining to your background and your interaction with telehealth. Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, hope everybody is safe. All right. Um, let me tell you a little bit about our clinical practice. We have, um, it, it's been in existence longer than I've been there. Um, it is a private practice. Um, it started out as a home-based private practice, as a matter of fact, where um, we were going into homes and <clears throat> Really, it was born out of kind of a research lab in terms of fall prevention for older, older adults. Um, we've morphed though now. We have a, about 20 to 25 therapists to kind of deliver services cradle to grave, believe it or not. Uh, we, have, we go from NICU discharge all the way through older adults um, at the community level, in the community. It's been really the core of what our practice has been. Um, and so when Cindy was talking about <clears throat> enrollment in Medicare, whenever we enroll in that program, it's all, we, we've enrolled our own program, obviously, is uh, to be able to see people in their homes, but all the providers are too. We do have some brick and mortar places, a couple of uh, sites, uh, Millican Hand Rehabilitation Center. So they don't really go out into people's homes. Um, and then uh, the, the rest of our team does. Um, in terms of telehealth, we were actually starting to pilot. So we wanted to actually do this about three years ago. And there really wasn't a secure line that we could get to, meaning a secure platform. Um, this is before we went into our current um, EMR system. And we were gonna have to go over and use a, um, another distant site that was located at uh, Children's Hospital. And there's a lot of politics and logistics about that, so we didn't really do it. Our psychiatry department was doing it, and um, I was really bugging um, our, our, uh, our leadership to, to let me do it too, but uh, it wasn't gonna happen. So anyway, we were actually piloting um, telehealth right as this whole COVID thing exploded. So it was kind of a natural and easy transition um, for us and something that we had been looking at. Started out with the pediatric therapist, uh, who actually kind of has some specialty areas in um, cognitive behavioral interventions for tics, um, working with Tourette's, and then obviously working with um, uh, children and you know who, who have um, regulation, self-regulation kinds of issues. Um, uh, and believe it or not, that that has worked very well. You wouldn't think that it um, does, but it does. Um, I think the clinicians who are doing it right now, who are doing delivering those types of services, what they found is um, they need to be prepared. They basically have a list of what they're going to go through. They let the client on the other end kind of know that. So there's some communication before um, the visit and, um, and getting um, prepared for that. <clears throat> so it's been um, a really good experience. Some of the things we've also found is we did educate all the team members on it. And it even boiled down to you must practice with each other um, prior to actually having a session with your client. Because um, there are things that you need to pay attention to, like your background, where the light's coming from, um, where you're looking in terms of you know, the, the camera and can you see this other person? Uh, can they see you, you know, and so we've learned along the way and we have such a great team. They share tips with each other and have practiced on each other for quite some time. So the populations that we're finding it works with other than our pediatric folks are, believe it or not, some of the hand therapists are able to do some follow up visits. They're not able to necessarily test strength, but they're really able to get in and actually do some measurements on some range of motion, believe it or not, if they can get positioned properly. Um, it's also working really well in our population that we work with, um, our cancer survivorship people who are having some basic issues with um, you know, yeah, fatigue and uh, we do what we call uh, metacognitive strategy training techniques with them. And so it works well with those guys. Um, not, we can't really deliver it necessarily um, effectively with our NICU population. Uh, it doesn't work when you have to work on feeding techniques with families in homes. So 
our baby bridge program is still delivered there. I don't think that telehealth is ever going to, um, to, to take over everything, right? Um, it, just, it just doesn't fit with some of the things we do. So during this whole COVID piece of it, we had a combination of things that we did. We were still going into the community in a very limited um, way to see people who were high risk, um, who we were actually trying to keep out of the hospital. Um, most of these were older adults. Um, some were younger adults who uh, have severe disabilities and so forth and so on, but are still pretty vulnerable. We were still seeing um, some pretty acute, um, what I would consider post-operative pr procedures. So if we didn't deliver some intervention, they were gonna have some really poor outcomes. And so during that time, obviously we were uh, disinfecting, wearing masks, and the whole PPE thing, uh, which has been another challenge too, because as we move forward and start to reopen, um, those will be our limiting factors is, is uh, making sure we have enough masks and enough hand sanitizers and uh, all, all those things that you actually need to kind of uh, keep the exposure risk low. So um, we are billing for most of it. I would agree with what everybody else has said. You must, must, must uh, verify insurance plans individually for each client that you have. Um, we don't care though if we're not getting paid for it. I mean, we still have to deliver the service. We feel like it's the right thing to do with clients. So, but for the most part we are, and I was very happy to see that, um, I think, you know, about half of them are actually letting us uh, bill for the normal therapy CPT codes. We too do um, the uh, statement at the top of our notes that basically said, yes, this client is aware that this is a, you know, a telehealth and is agreed and we have them sign a consent form that's actually uploaded into the record. Um, we identify the type of services it, it is and almost all of ours are synchronous, um, you know, video, telephone, communication, kind of both of them together. Um, we have done some of the work with some of the, just the e-check-ins and, uh, you know, just touch base with some folks. Um, and still billing for those. Again, uh, just like Clarice said, the, the payment is really low uh, on that, but it's, it's really, really more about the health and well being of the people that we work for. So, um, you know, we don't have CODAs in our practice. Um, doesn't mean that we will never have CODAs. We just have never been big enough, I don't think, to actually support a CODA in a way that was going to be effective. We, you know, our practice is really kind of more like a group of, a, a big group of specialists. You know, we have certified, certified hand therapists. We have people who are primary care um, kinds of folks who work in primary care clinics, and, and neurology folks who work in, um, you know, stroke clinics or neuromuscular clinics too. So we kind of partner with our physicians and people tend to line up like that. So, um, I think I've answered most of the questions. Um, I would definitely encourage everybody under the sun, and I do every day, and I write letters um, more than once um, to um, our dear friends at CMS about uh, making sure that uh, OT, PT, and speech are included in telehealth as providers because it's just silly um, not to include us, and we are very legitimate, and I still feel like um, we have a long way to go, but, um, Together as a, as a big group, I think we can make this happen. Um, and, and especially if we can get some of our customers or clients to say, hey, wait a minute, you know, I had this telehealth visit and it was great, you know. Um, so what we're seeing right now as we try to open up, by the way, too, are people are, are saying, well, you know, I don't know if I want to come into your clinic. I know that you're doing all this cleaning and we've got all these masks and social distancing's in place and so forth and so on. Um, I'd still rather you come to my home. So I, I feel like there's a huge benefit to go into people's own environments. And that's kind of what the core of our practice has been anyway. So. Any questions? I think we just got one in the chat oh. section. Um, but as I'm checking the time, I see it's 6.59. Um, we will still, of course, remain for the next 10 minutes on here for a question, question answer session. If we go over, that's okay. Uh, but if you need to leave at seven, that's understandable too. 
Um, Clarice, I'm going to go back to the gallery. Okay. Perfect. So within the group chat, Leslie asked, are functional measures serving in place of those standardized tests that cannot be performed in this format? For example, opening a jar to substitute for a grip strength um, measurements. Um, I'm not sure that there's any regulations that address that, but also standardized tests are not necessarily required um, when performing an evaluation. Obviously they're recommended and there's best practice, but uh, typically standardized testing is not required by any payer or by Medicare to be performed during an evaluation. But I would say that you could say, um, you could certainly you know, assess functional grip strength through opening a jar, and that's obviously a way to demonstrate objective improvement if they are unable to open the jar of peanut butter at the evaluation, but they are able to open the jar of peanut butter five days later, that's an objective measure that you can document. I, I agree with your response, Clarice. Um, I've had to give uh, advice to an individual that works within the St. Louis City Public Schools pertaining to her evaluations and things like that. And um, she's having to do her evaluations from a non-standardized perspective versus standardized, even within the school setting. And it looks like we just had a question for Jeff. Can you give us an idea of what a telehealth session looks like for a student in the severe slash profound population? Yeah, um, you know, I've, I, you start to realize pretty quick um, in this, uh, this experiment that I feel like I've been in uh, that, um, that certain populations lend themselves better to this setting, for example, sort of mid to higher functioning autism with the right supports uh, and behavioral redirects by caregivers could be probably one of the more effective areas. Uh, one of the toughest areas I think are the severe and profound population. Um, you know, if you do have a parent there that's patient that can help you work through things, uh, trying, to, trying to be able to first establish, um, it, it just takes some time to, to like I've had parents just uh, think it was like class, set the child in front of the camera and then just leave. And I'm like, oh, wait, 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 <laughs> please don't go anywhere. I need you. Um, and so, and then kind of like uh, explain our uh, levels of assistance and you know, how much is the moderate assistance? How much is, you know, maximal? What's really dependent? What's, what does fading mean? You know, those types of things. So trying to see those, um, you know, is, uh, is, is where I work. So a lot of times we're, I feel like I'm doing a, a home screen even though our evaluations typically have already occurred and we're not, and through this time, so since it's such a short and emergency period, uh, we're not doing the evaluation typically in this process. We're just serving the current caseload. Um, and so uh, what, what I wind up doing is uh, kind of reassessing. The first thing I did, to be honest, was to look at baselines uh, and see where was the where, where are the abilities and is this goal even addressable uh, in the home setting? And then of course, I'm always, uh, you know, Clarice brought this up and she's right. I'm, I'm always making sure to document where, uh, you know, where I'm at and, and, and the setting and what we're attempting. And, and, and so that hopefully, you know, anybody can read that note and get sort of an idea that, yes, we kind of got sort of thrown in this and we're doing this through Zoom, through telehealth. And, you know, and, and, uh, and then they, they kind of pointed us in, in the direction of some codes. There are just some things that wind up being caregiver consult uh, verse that it's not a billable moment. But, but sometimes what I've learned is that working that way, maybe for, uh, especially uh, with the right parents, like a session two, maybe even three, all of a sudden I can turn it into this billable moment where I can see and I have that baseline of, of what you know they could either pick up um, pick up the uh, hit the hit or knock the balloon away before or be able to uh, actually grab and bump uh, the um, the thing that glitters in their hand and then be able and then for them to be able to do that same movement again um, I, I know one of the tougher things that we've been trying to we're trying to do today was uh, try to do a wheelchair mobility uh, and actually get a child to propel. Well, she didn't have someone there 
to hold uh, the ca the camera. So, uh, you know, you're kind of like looking at them at a distance as they're kind of going across quickly uh, across the screen and, and trying to zoom in or see. Uh, but I have learned that if you can get somebody on a tablet, especially if I'm being able to see them right, uh, and I can actually see the tablet writing itself up close, and if they actually use a phone, and then I can zoom in and I can take them off the selfie mode that we're in right now. And so part of it's, you know, the aptitude and being able to get the, the parents to use the technology, be comfortable with that. And to be honest, there is a, there's the, I, I was surprised that even, it didn't necessarily always have to do with, um, you know, socioeconomics. Uh, sometimes it really just had to do with age and exposure uh, to being able to use uh, technology. Uh, and so even though we had some families that had limited resources, we have a 67% free and reduced lunch rate in this area. Um, you, even though you have the, the younger parents, often quite young, are very, com very comfortable with, uh, with this social platform. A lot of different social platforms and the idea of video interaction. So I was able to much more to zoom in on things and I could add But there's there's some information. Did I lose you? Hello. Um, we can hear you now. You at the very end, you faded out just a little bit, but I feel like we did okay. hear a majority of everything you said. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm just a little long, so I apologize. Go ahead. And there is a question for Clarice. However, Clarice, I know you created the quiz for this. Um. I'm feeling should we go ahead and post oh. that in within the chat portion so that people can then complete that now if they want. Wonderful. Thank you. Yep. So that's the quiz. I apologize if there are any spelling errors. I tried my best to catch them. Um, but again, you have to have at least 80% to pass and it will take us some time to go ahead and we are going to confirm that everyone who submits and it responds does have a mode of membership. So give us about a week or so to make sure that we're confirming that. Um, obviously this will be recorded, so we'll continue to check um, people who submit. And then Mary, in regards to your question, I don't believe that it's required. Um, I think if you have a standardized assessment, it significantly decreases your risk of denials. Obviously I could be wrong. I'm not sure, Cindy, if you know more about oh, that. When, when, when they took away the G codes and we no ha longer had to do FLR, then we were no longer mandated. It's just obviously always strongly encouraged that you do have some sort of, sta some sort of standardized testing. Um, so, but you can certainly, you can do a 30 second six stand, um, you know, uh, you can do a parcel. So there's things that you can do um, in that kind of a setting. And, you know, obviously if I'm doing a 30 second sit to stand, if they have poor balance, I'm not going to do that or do a functional reach unless there's a family member that's right there or somebody that can, can kind of spot them while they're doing that. So, you know, you're right, Mary, that yes, absolutely. We really want to continue to do those standardized testing because it gives you that data and it's easier to measure outcomes, but you can certainly get around um, doing it without doing an evaluation without having anything in there. Leslie, I'm reading your question here. I don't know that there's a bunch of pressure currently being put on therapists to collect data for quality assurance. Obviously, if you're part of an outpatient Medicare Part B and you're part of MIPS or some other programs, you have to collect quality data anyways. Um, I think this is something where we're all just trying to figure out how the heck this works. Um, it's a bit of trial by fire. I think most people would agree. I mean, I'm in a hospital-based uh, setting and it's been a bit interesting. We've been providing a lot of these services for free so that we can at least maintain um, patients' progress. Um, but I think if you are able to collect that data, it'd be really great to collect because obviously that is something that AOTA and other agencies can use to advocate for uh, long-term implementation of telehealth for occupational therapy, especially through Medicare. 
And I would just say that we're doing some very informal, you know, just kind of follow up. What do you think? Do you guys like doing this? And, you know, we are noticing, just like Pat was saying, that some of these people are like, you know what, I really like this. I don't have to go to the clinic. You guys can, you know, I'm, I'm really enjoying this. So we're getting really positive feedback. But then again, we're really carefully selecting the people that we're doing this with. And within the school setting, I know we're supposed to be taking data to assess progress on IEP goals as we're able to. Um, but of course, with this being a different situation for all of us, for all of us, it's not physically possible for all students, like Jeff mentioned. So I think it's really on a case by case basis at this point. Thank you for the question. <laughs> Yeah, Claire, I would I would say that um, on the uh, goal, being able to measure, we're, we're also being asked that right now. And mm -hmm. if a parent reports it, I will put it as such, but that doesn't mean I'm scoring it that way. If I can't see it, uh, if I can't really sort of confirm it in the moment, uh, you know, we, we want to think, I, I think parents want to think the best of their children. <laughs> uh, and so sometimes that can be subjective. Um, so, I mean, I think it's really a, a call there, but um, I, we, we've tried to stay conservative so that we feel our billing won't be questioned uh, as much and, and also to just really make sure that we're really being uh, effective. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, I think this, uh, I think the universal message here is obviously check with their payers before you start billing for it to make sure that individuals plans are covered covering telehealth and occupational therapy under telehealth, but also that you cannot over document in this scenario, especially I think it's good to document who is present for the session, who's providing the assistance, um, if anything to help, you know, make sure that you might get reimbursed, but also for your own protection and for legal aspects, you know, if something occurs during the session, especially through telehealth, you want to make sure that it's documented who was there and exactly what happened. So document 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 and and make sure that you have policies and procedures on this so it's not just like oh i think i'm going to start telehealth tomorrow but you really want to make sure you have policies and procedures so that if heaven forbid something happens where you're doing something and during a telehealth visit a patient has a fall what do you do how do you document that what is the follow-up so making sure that your facility has policies and procedures regarding telehealth is really critical a really good point, Cindy. All right, does anyone have any further questions? I can see it's 7-12, but we could still answer one more if someone has anything to pose. Thank you, Becky, and thanks for coming. Thank you. We're looking forward to having additional continuing education sessions in the future, so um, Clarice, if you're okay with it, feel free to email Clarice or myself via the email listed on the MOTA website um, to then propose additional topics for the future. Um, but we're really excited about this and we appreciate all of you attending tonight. Absolutely, thank you guys so much. Take care and stay safe.